First of all, we're talking about this for those of you who are tuning in uh, just now. We're talking, I'm going to be doing part two of coaching the coaching. So last time we did part one was talking about uh, different sort of elements that you're going to be considering when you're delivering a session. And now today I'm actually going to be talking about what that looks like to deliver the actual delivery of the session. So quick recap. So what, one of the pieces that I wanted to include as a recap piece here is the understanding that to, for learners to solve a problem before being taught the solution is more effective than learning the solution first, even when learners make mistakes or fail. Uh, and I know this may seem countercultural to some of the other things that you may have been taught or you may have heard. Uh, these aren't my words, these are straight from the research. I have put this into practice myself as well as a coach uh, with collegiate athletes, professional athletes uh, within various different types of sports. And it does, it does work. And so I'm going to uh, share that methodology with you today as we go through as well. So uh, when we're doing the session design, again, this is sort of understanding that it's this, it's interesting because I've titled this session or we've titled this session, coach the coach. However, it's really important for you to understand that when you're doing a session where you're, what we just talked about, where you're allowing the athletes to make mistakes, the session actually, actually becomes athlete centered and not coach centered. And so you may have heard terms like a guide on the side versus a sage on the stage. The methodology that I'm trying to present to you is more of the long that lines of the guide on the side mentality rather than the stage on the stage where you're standing at the front and kind of preaching. And I realize that may sound really strange or ironic, Alanis Morissette, in that I'm sort of sitting here and preaching to you or teaching to you. Uh, I personally don't prefer this style of teaching. I would rather actually be on the course with you and allowing to go through this uh, but because of where we're at with some of the restrictions, this is the way we're doing this for now. So uh, anyways, uh, the idea behind it though is all of this text here that I have is basically talking about the fact that it needs to be athlete centered rather than coach centered. And so really focusing on the athlete rather than the coach. I'm gonna, this is uh, in here as well as a reminder to understand the why. So the, the last piece here that I have, the last sentence here says, the coach believes they need to work on X and the player believes they need to work on why. And this has happened countless times. Uh, I've seen this as a coach myself. I've experienced this as an assistant coach. Um, I've seen it happening from, as being a secondary coach, as a strength and conditioning coach, and seeing coaches implement practice sessions and athletes coming away going, well, I don't understand why we were just working on this uh, because I felt like as a player, as a team, I needed to work on X. And then coach just came in and did a practice plan that decided to work on Y. And so it's really important that the coach and the athlete get on the same page and are understanding the why behind the session. This is also going to talk about one of the other pieces that we addressed in the last session was regards to motivation. Explaining the why is going to increase motivation. If everybody's on the same page, motivation increases, and then uh, the adherence to the session is going to be much higher as well. Okay. But again, understanding that this is partly why the guide on the side works as well and why this is athlete focused not coach focused okay so rather than coach bringing a whole pocket full of drills and this is maybe going to be really difficult for some people a coach is not showing up necessarily to a training session and saying we're going to do a warm-up then we're going to do this drill then we're going to do that drill then we're going to do this drill then we're going to do that drill and then we're going to end uh, what i'm going to propose to you is actually a very different model and a different structure that requires coaches to uh, be a little bit more creative a little bit more dynamic in their thinking and then in their processing uh, and be actually assessing what is happening with the athlete and then work with that assessment in real time to work together with the athlete rather than just having a pre-planned or pre-programmed session for the next hour or whatever the training session is that you're going to be with that athlete. So the methodology that I'm presenting is uh, GAG+. plus. So GAG stands for Game Activity Game. And that is, you, if you're familiar with education or you're familiar with coaching, you've probably heard of this mentality before of game activity game. So the idea is that you're going to start with a game, then you're going to do an activity, and then you're going to return back to play. Uh, and hopefully the athletes are then going to be able to use some of the skills that they developed within that activity then to apply to the game. Now, what I would like to use is a format that is beyond that even further. So rather than just a standard gag uh, game activity game session, I would like to take this a couple steps further. 
So what that looks like, if taking it a couple steps further, is game, skill learning, problem solving, activity, zoning in, and then the game again. So this is what, these are the five pieces here that I would recommend uh, using for creating a training session or a practice session, whether this be with um, whatever sort of ever level of athlete that you're working with, I'm going to suggest that this is probably the better route to go uh, for that, for the type of training session that you'd like to run and how you change the depth of that training session, how complex or how complicated you can make that training session is up to you as a coach in the development level or performance level of the athlete. Um, but to use this same format works with young people, old people, people of low skill, people of high skill, still using the same format. So understanding the, the game is so we open up with the game. So we start by playing disc golf. So we would go through our warm up process uh, that we talked about previously. We went through the starts warm up as one of the other sessions. So you're going to go through your warm up protocol. Once you've gone through our, our warm up protocols, you're going to move on to the opening game. What that means is we are going to actually play the, the game of disc golf as part of our training session at the beginning. And then you'll see we play it again at the end. And it's done very intentionally. The idea behind this and the concept that I want you to take away from this is that Think about putting together a puzzle. If you're putting together a puzzle and you have the box to look at, it's much easier for you to put that puzzle together. The playing the game is that very same thing. You, once you are playing the game, uh, you have then now you can look at it and go, oh, where am I struggling? Where am I strong? And then you can apply to the next pieces that we're going to use. So we actually go out and what we will do is we'll play two to three holes, usually three holes of actual disc golf, right? Now, if you're working within a school system or a different type of phys ed setting, whatever it happens to be, you can shorten these holes. You can play them, uh, you can play, play them shorter holes, whatever it happens to be, but actually allow the students or the participants or the athletes, if you're working one-on-one, -on -one, go out and play three holes of disc golf, okay? And then you can see in the little speech bubble there, through playing the game, players can identify areas that they need to work on, skills that they need to develop and refine. It is very easy for them to understand the relevance of working on a skill that they have recently used in the game. This, again, ties back to the why. So the athlete just practically went out and played and said, oh, man, like I was really struggling with, I'll give you an example of something I struggle with. I struggle with four hands into the wind. Oh, man, it's windy out. I was struggling with four hands in the wind. Maybe it's a good idea that we work with four hands in, into the wind today. It's windy out, and I can work on some forehand shots throwing into the wind. That's what I'm going to be doing. I've practically assessed that from like literally minutes or seconds ago from the play that I just had. Okay. So opening game. Now we're going to do skill learning. So this is the second part of the session, and this allows players to work on their technical skills. It is important to allow players to work on their skills immediately after the game. So again, this is done right away. We played the game. Oh man, struggling with forehand in the wind. Perfect. We are going to do skill, working on skill, forehand into the wind. Perfect. We're going to do it right away after because it's close to the activity. It's close to my brain. It's going to make the motivation much higher and it's going to make my desire to want to participate in that activity a lot higher. And understanding that if I do that, I'm going to be able to be better at it. Now, this isn't taking away from the other stuff that we've talked about while we're doing this. You still have to keep notes of all the other stuff that we talked about with random practice and block practice as well. So we can do this skill learning piece, but we are not going to do it in a block practice format because that's not how we coach. We coach with random practice formatting, right? So uh, we're going to allow players to work on their skills immediately after the game so that there's a close proximity between the disc golf game and the skills at work, right? Now, this part of session gives the players the opportunity to work on their most creative, up-to-date ways of playing the modern game, and players will be highly motivated to engage in developing these throws, right? So I struggle throwing forehands into the wind. So skill learning, I could continue to work on the skill of throwing forehand into the wind. What else could I do? Could I work on possibly throwing a thumber into the wind? Could I work on possibly throwing a tomahawk into the wind? Could I work on throwing a roller into the wind? These are all options. I don't necessarily have to specifically work on throwing a forehand into the wind in that moment. I'm going to work on solving the problem. And this is really important. This goes back to the second slide that I showed. The important piece here is that I have a problem. My problem is I need to get from A to B. A larger part of that problem is that it's really windy out and I struggle with throwing forehand into the wind. 
and I need to throw so that the disc makes a, for me, it would be a right hand uh, directional movement with the disc from the tee pad to the basket. Okay, so that's my problem. Get from A to B, and I need to make it have a right hand motion to doing so. So for me, the, the, what makes the most sense is throwing a forehand to be able to make a disc do that. But I struggle throwing a forehand in the wind. So the problem can have a variety of different solutions. So I can develop my forehand, which is one solution. Could I also possibly throw an understable disc on a backhand roller and make it? Maybe it might work. Could I throw a thumber and make it? Could I throw? And so this is part of the practice session where we allow athletes to be creative and look at different skill options to develop that part of their game. And I know you're thinking that that doesn't make any sense. It does make sense. This falls in line with the random style of practicing, right? It, it is going to be take a longer process for skill acquisition, but as we already discussed, skill retention and skill demand are going to be significantly higher using this methodology. You're going to use this skill learning piece uh, approximately for 15 minutes with the athletes. Uh, you can make it longer or shorter depending on how the athlete is working along with that. Part three is the problem solving activity. So during this section, players will, players will start to solve problems within the activity. So what we're going to do is we just were working on a skill. So the specifically, let's work on throwing a forehand. Let's work on throwing a backhand roller. Let's work on throwing um, a thumber. Let's work on throwing a tomahawk. We're going to work on that specific skill, right? Now what we're going to do is we're going to take the different skills and apply them to a different intentional problem. So we already have the problem of getting from A to B on the basket, which is what every, the problem that every disc golfer has. What we're going to do is we're going to make that into a problem solving activity and allow players to use skills to solve those problems, right? So some of the different problem solving activities I've already given you in the previous session where we talked about the game Mando. So that as a problem people are using, and if you remember what that, what type of con, um, uh, constraint that was, so an environmental constraint using Mando's where an athlete had to mandatorily throw around something, right? That's a problem solving activity. How are they solving the problem of having to go around a tree on every single throw that they have to make? It's going to force them to use different skills and to develop those skills, right? So we could use the game of Mando, the game that I also other, otherwise presented, the tic-tac-toe game, right? That is a problem solving game. I need to decide where I'm going to throw my disc to land within that grid so I can make my line and win the game of tic-tac-toe. I now have to decide how I'm going to throw, what disc I'm going to throw to be able to land it into the area that I need to land it in, right? And there's, uh, I have a variety of uh, different problem solving games that I've created. Uh, Rob McLeod and I were just talking about this recently, actually, and he's built quite an inventory of games uh, that are available to be played with disc sports. Uh, myself as well, I've built uh, quite an inventory of games that can be played using disc golf as the foundation for that. Um, and like I said, I have, uh, have those available for you if you're interested as well. Okay, well, we're going to use that as a problem solving activity. Zoning in. Now you may remember these words as well. We talked about these words when we did the starts warm up um, and we touched on them again briefly when we talked about practice and the idea of zoning in. And if you remember, if we have too much anxiety, we're not going to zone in. If we have too much boredom, we're not going to zone in. And we need to ultimately create something that's challenging for what the athletes are doing. So during our uh, problem solving, we're going to then move to zoning in. Once we've kind of figured it out, players will start to identify technical and tactical issues in their experiences that they learn from the problem solving game. So playing Mando as an example, they are playing Mando and they're realizing that there's a tactical problem that they consistently have. I consistently struggle with upshots or uh, a technical issue. I'm really struggling with straddles um, as I'm making some of these throws. So then we can apply some of the theories to adjust and allow the athlete to work on those as well. So this section allows players to work on those areas specifically. All right. So we started with the game and then we moved through to um, our skill learning. Then we moved through to our, uh, our problem solving activity. And now we're at zoning in and really trying to get that. We're trying to get finer and finer and finer, right? As we get closer. And so zoning in focuses on, on developing specific skills. It, it builds on both the skills learning section and the problem solving game. 
and amalgamating the individual technical skills with the tactical disciplines. So that is what zoning in looks like. If we move forward to the final piece that we have there, which is the closing game. So remember, we started with the game and we end with the game. Ultimately, this is there's the mo one of the most important things that we're doing. And I'm I'm going to reemphasize this because uh, I've come from coaching professional soccer, and I have seen way too many training sessions, practice sessions, where there's been a lineup of athletes standing on a line, kicking a ball to athletes standing on another line, or they have a coach has hundreds of cones laid out and athletes are dribbling around cones. Is there a time and a place for those things? Possibly. I would like to argue for the majority of the time. No, there isn't. Uh, unless you're having a drills competition and we are not having a drills competition. When I coach soccer, I'm not having a drills competition against the other team. I'm having a soccer game against the other team. When I'm playing the game of disc golf, I am not having a skill competition against somebody else. I'm having a disc golf game against somebody else. As such, it is very, very important to have the game at the beginning and the game at the end, because it is ultimately how you are competing is by playing the game. You are not competing by playing Mando. You're not competing, competing by being in a putting competition. You're not competing by playing tic-tac-toe. You're not competing by fill in the blank drill or a game or exercise or activity. You are not competing in the sport of disc golf, utilizing those. You are competing in the sport of disc golf holistically by playing the game of disc golf. Therefore, playing the game of disc golf is ultimately the best thing that you can be doing to develop yourself as a disc golfer. So we close our sessions by, again, let's go out and play. Now, because at the end of the session, we, we can tend to play more holes. If we have the time, we'll play three uh, to, and then wrap it up. If if it's a smaller group and we have the ability to, uh, we might just stick around and play the entire 18 holes together. All right. So it's ultimately, we're going to start with the game. We're going to end with the game because the game of disc golf is what we are interested in being better at. We're not interested in being better at drills and skills and activities. Okay. So it's really important to start and end with the game of disc golf. Now the game allows players the freedom to experiment in a live situation and therefore to stress test their skills in a chaotic and realistic environment. And this is so true. The game of disc golf is chaotic and all the other pieces that we've talked about with random practicing and anxiety and boredom and challenge points and all those pieces are trying to bring that all together. Uh, this is, I'm going to speak a little bit bluntly. I was watching the disc golf uh, network today and they were the pro tours on. Don't worry. I'm not going to give any spoilers. But it just really frustrates me when I hear things, when I hear some of the announcers saying that, oh, you can't train for these high pressure situations. Absolutely, you can. And there's people who do that professionally. And this builds into that. You are absolutely able to train for chaotic, high pressure situations. Uh, and it's all about how you build your training session. If you are intentional about it, you absolutely can build and train into those things. So with that said, rounding up, at the end of the practice, uh, you need to analyze how the session went. This analysis should include the session notes about, uh, about the game, the activities, the, the second phase, closing game, and all the pieces put together. All right. Now, if, you're, if you really want to develop yourself further as a coach, you can use something called reflective practice as well. Uh, and you can also do an interview process with your athletes. What I would encourage you to do, uh, and again, this is coming from a professional coaching environment, I would talk to my captains and my assistant captains post training session. And I would say, talk to me about that training session. Did it go the way that we had discussed prior to? Because remember, we had the conversation prior to. So to make sure that everybody was on the same page, we had the conversations before practice started. And at the end of the practice, I'm going to have that same process with my athletes. I'm going to say, this is what we talked about at the beginning of practice. You wanted to work on X. We agreed to work on X. How did it go working on that today? Okay, you didn't feel like we did this well, or we, you feel like we did do that well. You take notes of those, and then when you come to your next training session, you have those pieces with you so that you can either uh, continue to work on something or maybe remove something that doesn't need to be worked on and go forward from there, right? You can do this with your athletes. You can also do this individually as, with yourself as a coach. How was I today as a coach? Or, and asking those questions. Was I, uh, it's something really simple. Was I, when I was coaching, was the sun behind me or was I looking into the sun? 
you want to be looking into the sun when you're communicating with your athletes. If you're standing with the sun behind your back, your athletes are squinting while they're looking at you and they cannot see you properly. So just something as simply as where was my body placement in relation to my athletes as I was communicating with them, right? Was I turning my back to them as I was trying to explain how to tee off and they couldn't hear me properly, right? And just simply asking yourself those questions, right? So that's part of your rounding up. Now, this is really small and I apologize for that. If you're interested, I can give you a bigger, bigger version of this. This is a, this is a document that I've created. It does include some of the information that Paul shared today as well, talking about flight characteristics. It talks about some of the other stuff that uh, Eugene has shared about as well. Um, you can see that this example here that I'm giving you 6.5 session example is page 51 of a document. The document is almost hundred pages in length that talks about the history of disc golf, talks about sort of everything encompassing that you could think of disc golf. And like I said, this is page 51 of a document that I've created, but this out, this specific page outlines this five-step model that I just presented to you tonight with regards to how to deliver a training session. Now, I realize I went pretty quickly. Uh, I, I tend to have a tendency to talk a little bit fast, uh, but if there are questions out there, please feel free to ask those questions to me. I don't see any questions in the Zoom chat. I'm going to refresh my Facebook chat here because it didn't seem to be keeping up with me, but I don't know if I see, I don't, doesn't look like I see any questions in the Facebook chat. I don't know if Melissa, you had any questions or uh, if anybody shot you a message about them, but for the most part, that is what I wanted to share with you uh, today about coaching the coach. And uh, again, as always, if you have questions, feel free to reach out to me, post them in the chat. I will come back and look afterwards and I'll do my best to answer those questions. But again, thanks for watching Coach the Coach and uh, the session on delivering a session. Uh, I hope this was helpful for you and thanks for watching.